onto the computer. All right, well, welcome out everybody this Friday afternoon, it's September 24th. I'm Dr. Carlos Grandella from Viewfinder Low Vision. And I have with me today, special guest Dorinda Reif from the Arizona State Schools for the Deaf and Blind. Um, last month, we talked with the Foundation for Blind Children, talked a lot about education, the importance of uh, having low vision exams for children who have a visual um, impairment or any kind of a visual need, really. Um, and so I wanted to make sure we touched on um, not just what's done in nonprofit situations, but what's done through the state and in public schools. Um, a lot of really good information to talk about. Um, I don't do as much of this these days at Viewfinder. We see a lot more um, a geriatric base of patients. Um, and I kind of miss it. I did this a lot in Chicago at the uh, Lighthouse for the Blind. We worked with uh, early intervention services for um, infants, you know, six months old, um, up to, you know, teenagers getting ready to leave high school. Um, so there's a wide range of people who could need these services. And for each individual who comes in, they, they have a wide selection of um, different things they're going to need. So I'm going to turn the time over to Dorinda and say, you know, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to um, ASDB and then about the program itself? You bet. So uh, ASDB serves students in basically three different service delivery models. Uh, first, you were talking about infants and ASDB has the state contract to work with birth to three um, children with visual impairment. And um, FBC works with the students who are in the Phoenix area and or the children and their families in the Phoenix area and then ASDB covers the rest of the state. Similarly, we have two site-based schools in Arizona, one uh, in Tucson, which is where I um, reside, uh, that is a school for the blind and a school for the deaf. And it has some residential students and some day students um, that are served both uh, deaf and blind uh, sharing that same campus. In addition, we have the Phoenix Day School for the Deaf uh, in Phoenix, where we have a number, I think we are up over 30 students in that school also have visual impairment in addition to, um, in addition to deafness. So, um, so that school is, is a day school only. Those were sort of the beginning of of ASDB as a state agency, but um, many years ago, before I came to Arizona in 1997, um, the state realized that we needed services in public schools as well. So um, ASDB runs three cooperatives uh, regionally. There's one in the Phoenix area, there's one in Tucson, and then there's one that sort of, I call it sort of the rainbow. It starts in Yuma, it's up into, um, uh, Sedona and Flagstaff, and then over to Holbrook and, um, and Sholo in that area, uh, where we provide teachers to serve students who are in um, their neighborhood schools, typically their neighborhood schools. Um, we do provide services to private schools as well, but that is always a little bit different because it's up to the district where that private school uh, is to determine what services they're going to provide for their students with, um, with disabilities. So that really varies. Um, there are some parts of Arizona that have um, really strong services in private schools for students with visual impairment, and then some that are not uh, providing much more than, say, materials um, to help the student uh, participate with, uh, with their peers. So my background um, it has been as a teacher of the visually impaired and orientation mobility specialist. And uh, currently I serve as the low vision specialist for the state uh, working under ASDB. So my job is to make sure that not only students have clinical low vision evaluations like what, what Dr. Um, Grandella provides to us, but also the devices that are prescribed as a result of that CLVE. I won't go into a lot of details about that exam it, itself. I think you've probably already covered that. But for us, it's super important because it takes into consideration the child's prescription in addition to his low vision, uh, low vision needs or their low vision needs. And so we think we get, um, we get the right stuff for the student because of 
because of that um, combination. One thing that I think is unique for us working with students, although I have a, a father who is 93 and has low vision and is, uh, has now become almost completely blind, and I experienced the same reluctance for him to use devices that I have experienced with my, um, with my students, uh, you all know that um, often kids don't want to look different from their peers in, in any way. So we use a combination of uh, specially designed um, devices um, for students and um, mainstream devices. So, you know, the phone has become um, a, a really reliable tool for, um, for students for both distance and near, but it doesn't do everything that a a more uh, fine-tuned device does. So um, our job is to teach the student how to use that device um, and place that device in the home and in the school. I'll talk about that more in a second and um, make sure that they know enough about how to use it so that they can make a good decision themselves. Um, so uh, Carlos, you had asked about, the, um, about whether we place uh, devices in students' homes. So uh, the way that special education law works, when we determine that a device is needed for a student in, um, in school to access a curriculum, and if that student then needs to, to access that curriculum at home as well, then it's our responsibility to provide that device in the home as well. It may not look exactly the same. Sometimes we, um, sometimes we provide a, a full desktop um, CCTV, for instance, at home, and we might use something portable um, in school, and vice versa. We might use a handheld at home, and we might use something that's distance and near in the classroom. So it just, uh, just depends on the student. And then our teachers who are teaching travel to people with visual impairment um, are using things like monoculars, uh, they are supporting uh, students getting ready to drive in some cases, and also wayfinding devices that are, that are low vision friendly. Um, I might use a, a GPS on my phone and a visually impaired or blind person might use a, a wayfinding device that has more audio features, for example, um, to navigate. So it's, it's really a little bit of, of all of that. So ASDB serves um, really from birth to 21 um, in, our, in our various programs. Babies are served um, through their families, as you, as you might imagine, and then students certainly in the school setting, but also um, in the environment, because we know that um, our kids' needs are not just in the educational setting of the school, but also in their neighborhoods and in the grocery store and um, on buses and you know all kinds of things like that. So um, I think we're pretty well rounded in how we um, provide services. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that I do, and I offer this to uh, folks, whether they're part of ASDB or just part of the general public, um, you know, we can help you with um, going through an eye exam to understand it. You know, the report to understand it better. Um, to talk about the student's visual, unique visual impairment and what that might mean uh, so that they're more um, prepared even to ask the right questions when they go into an eye doctor or, um, or other professional. So we provide that and, um, and I do a lot of training. So um, I do um, probably about every six weeks, I do a training on color vision testing or depth perception or um, uh, different tools for testing eye, mo eye mobility or motility, um, whatever my teachers are saying that they, uh, they need help with, how to figure out print size mm -hmm. um, for, a, for a student who has um, a device or, or just glasses, that kind of thing. So, um, so I'm a resource and I provide a little bit of direct service, but um, mostly it's supporting the teachers in their, um, in their settings. How did you uh, get to that position of um, becoming a resource? Did you have a lot of time that you did do direct services or 
where were yeah, you? Yeah, thank you. you. That's here? a thanks for that question. Um, yeah, I started um, as a high school English teacher and then a teacher of the visually impaired, actually starting in the mid eighties. And, um, and I taught travel to, um, to children in um, Colorado initially, and then moved to Arizona in 1997. And um, there I, I did a combination of teaching and some administrative work. So I did evaluations and um, did some orientation mobility, that kind of thing. And then for many years, I did school administration. So I worked as principal of the School for the Blind, um, and I worked at Perkins School for the Blind mm. as their superintendent for a number of years. So um, coming back to Arizona was um, meant to be sort of a test in semi-retirement, and I didn't really like that. Okay. And so I'm a uh, I'm back to, to low vision. I, I got my low vision certification from um, Pennsylvania, then Pennsylvania College of Optometry, now Salis University, and really had not used it a lot with, mm -hmm. um, with students. And so now I, I get to use that part of my brain, which is really fun. Yeah, and for those who watch this uh, webinar who don't know that, that has a lot to do with the acronyms that come after uh, Dorinda's name. So the COMS, Certified Orientation Mobility Specialist, is that correct? And then the CLVT is a Certified Low Vision Therapist. And so um, these are certifications you go out and, and get, it takes training um, in order to um, teach people how to use these devices and how to use things appropriately. You can imagine teaching a kid, you know, to watch, uh, to walk a, uh, I want to say a busy street with an orientation cane. Correct. Um, I, I've been there to watch what an orientation specialist does, and it's a lot of work and a lot of patience and a lot of training. You can imagine how scared someone is to do yeah, that for the really, first time. It's really an exciting thing to uh, to introduce a, a student, especially using a combination of low vision devices and um, and blindness tools, is um, can really make a difference. And here in Arizona because uh, people with certain levels of low vision can um, get driver's licenses, it's really exciting to be part of that discussion with families too, to see if that might be an option for, um, for students. When I was in Massachusetts, that was not part of the deal. It had, mm -hmm. that law had not passed. And so yeah. um, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's really an honor to be able to help, help kids navigate that and think about what they might do with their future if they are able to. Um, drive with a device. So, absolutely, uh, I think that's one of the best things um, I get to talk to people about, especially teenagers um, or young adults who think they missed that window altogether. Yeah. Um, so, Dr. Grandella, one of the things you asked me about were um, residential program and day program mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, opportunities for ASTB, and. Uh, the way that it works here is that students who live too far away from school to go back and forth on a daily basis mm -hmm. um, are, are, are the only students who are residential students. Um, kind of an interesting thing that's happened with COVID is when the schools closed um, initially in um, 2019, we ended up bringing many of our residential students onto campus, living in the dorms and accessing their education um, virtually. And the reason for that is that we serve a lot of students who are in areas that don't have internet access or have very limited internet access. And so those kids would not have received education during that time. I, I know some teachers are doing, tele, we're doing telephone, Mm -hmm. um, lessons with students, for instance, on some of the reservations that had um, difficulty to connect. And so I thought that was a really innovative um, thing that ASD decided to do, bringing the students in, keeping them safe, but um, facilitating their education that way. And, and in a perfect world, when we have um, numbers and um, opportunities, we offer um, really complete access to education and opportunities for students to meet other students with um, visual impairment, to play sports more, um, uh, more easily, to um, engage in art classes from someone who understands visual impairment. All those kinds of things are an advantage for our students who are, who are on campus, but that is often considered to be a restrictive environment by some 
um, by some standards. And so most of our students are served in their home schools and their home districts. Mm -hmm. um, across the country, about 10% of students with visual impairment are served in schools for the blind versus 90% in, uh, in regular schools. Um, we also take advantage of the state um, the state's opportunities like uh, FBC's summer programs um, and uh, offer some of those programs ourselves, although they're, they're somewhat, um, somewhat limited, but FBC has some really nice summer stuff um, for students to participate in. That's wonderful. And I think, that, I think that's pretty much it for me. If I didn't cover anything else, please let me know. So let me dive um, back into it a little bit. Um, some of the things, you, you know, I've got young kids. Um, my kids are all five and under. Um, so coming at it from a parent's view, I would think about, you know, um, so what is the first level of age that um, kids would interact with ASDB programs? Oh, yeah, great question. So as soon as we learn about a, a child who has a visual impairment or, or a suspected visual impairment, um, that process starts right off at, um, I, I, I know professionals who have met parents in the hospital um, when they have learned that their child is visually impaired. It's, it's sometimes a challenge to get that communication going and to make sure that parents know that they have access to those services. Um, but uh, during the pandemic, the services that we provided to birth to three children were done virtually. Um, where you know we were visiting very much like this, where the parent has the, the child with them. Um, and now I think across the country, you're seeing more of a hybrid model for that so that um, professionals are going into the home um, mm -hmm. for part of the um, sessions and are doing virtual sessions for part of the, of the time, which I think is actually a really nice opportunity on both sides. Um, I always joke that we don't want to, a new mom to worry about whether her house is tidy um, when she's inviting these uh, people in. And sometimes a virtual meeting takes the pressure off of, of all of that. But it, but you know, nothing replaces in person. So a, a hybrid model can be really, really nice for that. So um, you also might receive services from an orientation mobility specialist, even with a young, very young child, to um, assess their needs for movement in their environment and give them canes in some cases. Uh, so we do that as, as well. And then in the school system, um, it really just depends. Uh, because you've had FBC um, as a guest, you know that they serve some districts and a SDB serves some districts and some districts have their own teachers um, independent. So some of the larger districts like here in Tucson, TUSD has its own um, teachers and orientation and mobility specialists. Uh, another um, new program through ASDB in the last two years is that we are offering 100% virtual um, uh, education services to kids who are blind or visually impaired and hearing impaired um, or deaf. And that is really helpful for the places where um, that are really a long drive away from a, mm -hmm. uh, someone who, who could serve them so they get more regular services that way. And we're learning the, the ropes for that. And the pandemic sort of rushed that, rushed that through. A lot of teachers now are learning how to do that um, online. For me personally, being able to get into a parent's home um, if the child is school age and maybe I'm visiting the child while they're, they're at home, I get a chance to talk to the parents more. I get a chance to see what the environment is like so that I can help with lighting um, adaptations, contrast issues, those kinds of things to help make their environment um, more friendly uh, mm -hmm. for their kids. So that's actually been a... Um, a really nice advantage of the of the distance um, education format. I think one of the big things I would bring up for any parents who watch this who have a very young child and might be wondering, um, you know, what benefit would a, a low vision exam be to an infant or a toddler? Um, what what can my tiny child, or perhaps my nonverbal child, tell me about their vision? Um, there are several tests that we can do that. 
you, you don't have to say a word and we can understand and you know at least the given level of vision um, would, would you talk about that about nonverbal patients yes you bet well one thought um is that we hear from parents a lot that when they get the diagnosis for their uh, for their child of blindness or visual impairment, they're not given a lot more information. And so, you know, um, an ophthalmologist uh, is, is a diagnostician mm -hmm. who says, yes, you have a visual impairment, but is not necessarily paying attention to what that means um, for the child day to day and for functional um, kinds of things. So if we are, if you are testing um, young children, nonverbal children, and so on, and you give us information about, say, the, um, the sphere of, of vision that the child has. So, um, you know, is, is the child able to see past 12 inches, for instance, and are bright colors better than, um, than uh, pastel colors, for instance, that kind of thing, then, um, then we can apply that to adaptations in the home. Um, I love to bring just a simple quilt with a black side and a white side and be able to present toys on those given mm -hmm. uh, after I've gotten information from you that the child has contrast issues, yeah. um, that a black toy on a white background or a yellow toy on a black background is much easier to pick out than one that is um, on a busy background, which is so typical in nurseries, you know, in, um, in babies' nurseries, we have pastels and we have um, lots of patterns and, and that kind of thing. So taking your information, um, we can, can apply that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, because we've mostly been talking about ocular uh, visual impairment, but brain-based visual impairment um, has, has, as one of its components, the, um, the opportunity to learn to improve Yes. Um, vision. And so once we have that diagnosis of CVI, cortical or cerebral visual impairment, then we can help um, actually set up the environment that makes it much easier for the child to access things visually. And then um, and they get better at using their vision. So um, that's a major role that we play with the babies. The other thing that we do with the, with the really young ones is that it might just, there might not be quite a diagnosis yet. Um, it could be that an eye is turning in or, um, or um, that the child is not responding visually or something like that. But, but um, an exam shows that there's, um, you know, not a, um, not a visual acuity loss or something like that. We can help the parents navigate um, that along with you, honestly, um, uh, to figure out what to, what to do next. So anytime we get a referral, we follow up and whether we think the child has a visual impairment or not. Yeah. And, and again, that just touches on that. There's such a, a spectrum of what mm -hmm. can be going on to cause visual impairment, um, yeah. whether it's an eye disease, whether it's a, a processing dysfunction, whether, you know, it, neurological damage and things like that. And, um, yeah, we want to get kids help as soon as we can. And that, that's the most important thing. So I, I, you know, I love the idea of showing up in the hospital. Um, yeah. I, I don't yeah. do that myself, but, uh, you know, kudos <laughs> to the professionals that make that happen. Yeah, um, it's really an honor to be there to, to help parents at that point. It really yeah. is. And I think it's really surprising sometimes if put in the right setting, how much a child can tell you um, about what they are and what they're not getting. Um, one of the things that uh, my wife will laugh at me about um, is whenever I see a baby, I'm, I'm always playing the will the baby follow my face game. So I go back and forth. The infants, that's, you know, <laughs> that, that's a very interesting target. They're programs for faces. And so I always, you know, I'm always going back. Should we just stop that? And, you know. I do the same thing. I also look at photographs to see if the, um, the light is shining evenly in, in pupils. Um, <laughs> just instinctively, uh, but also, you know, since you mentioned faces, I think that, um, that, that when some children with certain visual impairments, either brain-based or ocular don't respond to faces that can be really concerning for parents. And so, um, helping them navigate that, mm -hmm. uh, and giving them other ideas for how to bring attention to the face or to provide alternate targets is really important too. I hear so often from mothers of and fathers of blind children how challenging it is when their child doesn't make eye contact. 
Absolutely. because that's just a, you know, a regular thing that people do with babies. And mm -hmm. um, so we help with that as well. So we've touched a lot on the very early side of things, you know, and there's the early intervention programs and that's the zero to three. And then we um, get into kind of the preschool. Um, and so uh, a lot of what we talk about in the school system is, is the IEP, the individualized education plan. Um, and so for parents who might be new to that, would you expound a little bit on what an IEP is and how ASDB kind of influence that or, or um, kind of give their counsel and, and help that along? Yeah, you know, because it's a federal, um, a federal program, uh, there are certain rules that we have to follow, uh, but really it starts with a referral that, um, that there's a concern of, of some sort, and we, uh, we need two things to show that a child is eligible for services um, as a student with visual impairment. One is that there's a documented visual impairment, and um, Legally, that has to be an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, but with brain-based, we I have I know we have accepted um, neurological um, reports as well for that. And then there has to just be a determination of whether it makes any difference, uh, whether it's affecting the child's access to to education. So there are some students who have very mild visual impairments who don't have trouble with distance access or good readers are. Um, you know, able to access their education just fine, but some are not. And um, a, a recent interpretation of the law says that uh, issues that are um, eye motility issues, um, where there isn't a reduced visual acuity, can also mm -hmm. qualify as a student for, um, for services. So once that eligibility is met, and that starts with parents' permission to test, then the team, the IEP team, gets together um, to, first of all, to determine that, that yes, the child is eligible for uh, VI services, but then second, what, then what does the child need? Um, so, it, so yes, they're visually impaired. Maybe they need um, uh, enlarged print. Maybe they need um, uh, Braille. Maybe they need um, uh, environmental adaptations that will just let them access the um, the curriculum. And we always go off of the, of the school curriculum um, mm -hmm. for our services. So, um, so that is all a series of meetings and permissions and discussions. And then we develop goals for what the, the child needs related to that disability. So um, for instance, if, if a child has very low vision or is, um, or is blind, um, what does that child need to uh, get around school safely. Mm -hmm. um, and so we might add orientation mobility services to the IEP for that. Mm -hmm. And then as the child moves forward through the school years, you know, we meet once a year and then we look at our assessments every three years. Um, but and then at 14 and then moving into 16, we look at transition. Uh, and um, transition is one of those magic words that people throw around all the time, but Lots of times they don't fully understand. And uh, the fact is that I say that transition services start at birth because you're always moving towards becoming an independent adult. That's your, that's your goal all the, the whole way. But um, between the ages of 14 and 16, 16 is the federal age, 14 is what we do here in Arizona. Um, we start writing a plan for that transition. What skills? does the student need to be successful moving into a college setting, moving into a work setting, moving into assist, an assisted setting? What skills does that um, student need in that time frame? Because um, unfortunately, because the services are rendered differently um, between schools and, and adult services, and I, I do wish that Mark could be here to fill in some of this, um, we need to make sure that we have a good conversation. Um, because maybe the child's been using a, a braille note or a, um, or a digital magnifier or something like that, and is going to need that same tool in college or at work, um, or in, in another setting. And so we need to make sure that the transition is, is smooth for that and that the child's prepared to move, um, to move forward. I'm a big advocate of work experience whether you're going to college or not. Um, 
And I think that work experience starts very young with jobs around the house and then exposure to careers and then um, some job experiences and, um, and moving forward. And I'll try not to tangent on that too much. That's a real passion for me because um, the unemployment rate is, is high for people yeah. with visual impairment. And we really want to prepare them as much as possible for the world of, of work. You took that in a great direction because that's really where I wanted to head was, you know, kind of as we go through the years. So, you know, students are going to at whatever age um, that, you know, a uh, visual impairment, visual need is discovered through an evaluation um, or through, you know, something going on in the classroom that homework is found to be tough and we suspect something might happen and a school screening catches there might be a need and that's, you know, spawns an, an evaluation. Um, you know, that, that can be, you know, infants like we talked about, or there's many conditions don't show up until adolescence, like Stargardt disease or retinitis pigmentosa. Um, so you really can come at any age. The evaluations are done and recommend, recommendations are made and IEP meetings um, are held. There's a lot of good recommendations um, that can be made. And so for parents who will listen to this, this can, uh, again, run a wide spectrum from, like you said, orientation mobility services to finding your classroom and things like that, or something as simple as preferential seating, sitting ahead in the classroom so it's easier to see the board, sitting away from windows, large size print um, text for assignments or homework, extended time on assignments, extended time on tests, increased rest periods and things like that for eye fatigue. Um, are there any other kind of like top 10 um, accommodations that you often have listed or, or things that you wish they would list more often? So uh, you gave some really great ones there. And, and what I was thinking of when you were speaking is, is the world of work. So when, mm -hmm. uh, when kids are, are exposed to job sites um, and that kind of thing, accommodations can take on sort of a, a different view and, um, I was working with a, a student a couple of weeks ago um, to figure out whether his low vision, he has RP, so and much diminished visual fields and, and acuity, he wants to be a welder. Can he take, take a welding class and can he be a welder, can he safely be a welder? Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, looking at, at what is the job setting like um, for that? Mm -hmm. um, he, he also is, um, was doing some things with automobiles over the summer. And we talked about, you know, how are you providing light for, for being able to see, uh, see the engine better when you're working on it with your dad, um, that kind of thing. So I guess what I would say in my top 10 is, uh, is looking at different environments. So, mm -hmm. um, the school, you know, especially, I always say, especially the, the schools for the blind, sometimes we over accommodate for kids. We just sort of make things appear for them. And so in the real world, you know, your teacher doesn't always have your materials ready for you in a, in a format that you can, um, that you can access. And so understanding that different um, environments will have different, uh, different adaptations, the simple things around the house of uh, providing contrast so that uh, contrast and lighting so that um, navigation is, is safe and um, learning how to cook is, is easier, or cutting up vegetables or, or whatever. So I'm a big lighting and contrast um, person. I, in schools, I think it's, it's, not, um, it's not the best accommodated. I think that um, a lot of it has to do with kids not wanting to look different, but um, as much as we can show kids how to make their own adaptations that way, you know, fold the paper in half, put it against a black background, whatever, um, works not facing windows. Can't tell you how many times I've walked into classrooms where students at a computer and the window is behind the, the computer. And that's just a really difficult, um, uh, difficult setting to, to manage, but also then just, um, negotiating a, a space safely, mm -hmm. um, uh, helping students advocate for access, uh, good braille signage. Um, uh, I know it's controversial, but high contrast on, on edges of, of stairs um, mm -hmm. for, for students with low vision. Um, I, 
I belong to a Facebook group of teachers of the visually impaired and orientation mobility specialists and people post pictures all the time of you know, things that are just, just need to be tweaked to make it easier for our students to, um, to access the environment. But we want kids to graduate being able to ask for those things themselves. Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I 100% agree that, that being a personal advocate is so huge. And, and unfortunately, I, I think it's one of those things that with vision impairment, you can never get away from, um, especially if you have a vision impairment that's not obvious, yes. um, which I think is the majority of cases. Um, unless you're carrying a white cane with you or you wear one of those buttons that says I'm visually impaired, yeah. there's not a way for people to know. And um, it's, you know, many people struggle with making peace with the fact that they have to bring this up over and over and educate and educate um, and do these public service announcements for everyone else to understand. Um, but to, you know, to understand how to do that and do it effectively, um, I think is a really important tool. So that when you are getting, you know, on an airplane and you need somebody to help you to your gate or going to the grocery store and you can't tell between two cans of soup or something like that, that um, you, you know the ways to get assistance and that you can advocate for yourself that way. I think it's a huge I, way to stay independent. I agree. And I think that, that the uh, folks who learn that skill end up being the most independent. Yeah. For sure. Because we all need to ask for help for you know, for some things, it's not um, specific to people with disabilities. We all need to be able to advocate for for our unique needs. Yeah, and we've so talked about, you know, so we're kind of getting to the end of, you know, where school is and, and into college and employment. And um, we've talked before in this uh, program about um, employment opportunities. We had Arizona Industries for the Blind on a couple months back, and we've talked about vocational rehabilitation and that's where kind of the state starts saying, okay, we're looking at college, we're looking at employment. Um, there's the business enterprise um, system where um, we're looking at being a business owner. Um, so I, I think, you know, having the idea of working towards that transition from 14 to 16 is great yeah. because we do have to have our eyes forward and say, well, after school, what are we going to do? Yeah. Uh, many people um, kind of scoff at the idea of, you know, working. Um, in, in spite of blindness, but there are people who have no vision at all, who are completely successful, 100% independent, run their own business, type A kind of people. And um, I, you know, I want any child who happens to listen to this or any parent to know that 100%, there's nothing stopping them. Yeah, yeah that, that's such a great sentiment. I always, uh, I think about, um, experience, uh, you know, I said I obsess a little bit about transition and work sometimes. And uh, I have I have a sort of a pocket full of stories of, of times that I've had students in work settings where it was a, a controlled environment and an, a bit, they had the ability to work out something that they just hadn't had any experience in. Um, here's an example. So uh, this was when I actually was in, at Perkins um, we had a young lady who was placed in a, um, in a nonprofit. Uh, I believe she was um, proofreading or was a reader or something like that. And she was in a cubicle and she'd never worked in a cubicle before. And she didn't have the concept that this whole room was filled with cubicles. And how does one negotiate cubicles to communicate with other people in, a, in an office setting? Um, a sighted person, would have the same issue. How do I negotiate this, but would be catching uh, information through their vision um, uh, to understand how to negotiate that. And so this young lady um, stood up and said to the room, what do I do next? And it was such a great um, teachable moment for her to understand that that's not what we do when we're in a, in a room full of cubicles, even though we really want to sometimes. And and to then start uh, mapping the room and figuring out where is it that your supervisor sits so that you can go to that person and talk to that person or use the phone or, mm -hmm. um, or an app or, or whatever. But until you're in those situations, you don't necessarily develop those, those concepts. When I think of every time I've started a new job, the learning curve, the things I've had to learn to understand how to negotiate a, a new organization, it's not any different for somebody who's blind or visually impaired. 
that you have to, to learn those things. And I just love giving students multiple opportunities to um, experience that so that they can, um, like I said, learn some of those things in, in a safer environment where they can um, discuss it with other people and problem solve and figure out what they're gonna do next. So I think that's so invaluable for people. I feel like a question I get often when, uh, so, you know, I do an extensive case history with patients and we, we go through questions like, you know, um, do you have a hard time seeing the buttons on a microwave? Do you, you know, all kinds of different things. And um, so I had a young man in uh, the other day who was in college and um, I said, you know, when you're there on campus, uh, do you have any trouble traveling around from class to class and things? And, and he told me, no, he did just fine. He used this cane. He felt like he could get everywhere he needed to go. And his mom said, well, hold on. You only know how to get where to go because you and your dad went and mapped everything out to begin with. And, and it brings up a great point of, well, he felt he didn't have a problem with it because he had planned and organized that well. And mom said, well, but the issue was that we had to do that to begin with. And I, I like the fact that he's feeling comfortable because he knows his adaptations. So if he's going to have another semester with new classes, well, what does he do? He goes and he plans the routes again, and he, he's got his adaptation. He's 100% independent because he's organized and he's planned. That's great. That's a great, that's a great example. And frankly, for some people who maybe have a little more anxiety traveling than others, sighted or not, going and figuring out where your classes are before anybody else is on campus can be a real gift. Yeah. Yeah. That I love that comparison of, of his attitude of, well, that's just what you do. I right. guess that's what we're all working for or working towards. That's a great story. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking through my questions here to see if there's anything that we didn't touch on. Um, I thought that was fantastic. Um, you know, I really appreciate the work that you guys do. And, and I've had the opportunity to go out and, you know, meet you guys out in Yuma and places like that. And um, of course, you, you know, your staff will come in and um, meet with me here along with students. And it's a great opportunity to have that connection from the evaluation to the training and support. That's an ongoing thing. Um, thank you so much, Dorinda, for taking some time on a Friday to meet with me. And you um, bet. I think we do have. Yeah, Marshall just had a nice um, comment. And then I think a question. Mm -hmm. So what resources are available for colleges and universities for hearing impaired adults who lost their vision as an adult and want to go to college? What so a Marshall, great question. That's a great question. Thanks for putting that in. Dorinda, if you want to go ahead and then I'll piggyback on that. Yeah, I, um, my information about what's happening in Arizona might be a little bit outdated, but I have, um, of course, we have a number of of students who, um, who end up with Usher syndrome. Um, and now with genetic testing, they're learning that, that um, you know, they are hearing impaired to start with and, um, and they, they know ahead of time that they're going to experience a visual impairment um, afterwards. And in, um, in Arizona, we have for school age, um, the DeafBlind Project, um, which, um, registers people who are deaf and blind um, in the state of Arizona and then provides resources for them. And they do a lot to support students to help them move, uh, move forward and to prepare for college or um, find resources and so on. Um, uh, it's really important to understand that deaf blind does not mean that you are totally deaf and totally blind. Um, the definition of deaf blindness is a hearing impairment such that it affects your, uh, you know, communication ability and a visual impairment that also um, affects, you know, your concept development or your movement or whatever. And they don't necessarily have to rise to the level that they do um, for a special education eligibility level. And so um, we know that dual sensory impairment um, can, a little vision loss and a little uh, hearing loss can add up to a, a lot of, uh, of challenge. And so, um, the Deaf Blind, Blind Project, which by the way is housed at ASDB and has offices around um, the state provides a lot of that assistance. I have a good, uh, good friend colleague who uh, is a deaf blind, uh, he's an he's a orientation mobility special, specialist, but has extensive training with 
people with um, deafness and blindness. And he uh, works with clients all the time to help um, them negotiate a new um, living space, a new job, um, and that kind of thing with, um, with regard to their uh, dual sensory yeah. um, impairment. I've, I've taught routes to new um, apartments or housing um, places for, um, for deafblind people. It, it's ideal to have somebody who is fluent in ASL to work with those um, individuals um, because I'm not, I have an interpreter with me when I, um, when I do those, those kinds of things, but, um, but we do have, have good services for, um, for people and Voc Rehab um, also provides services to people who are deaf and blind. And that's kind of where I was gonna take it from there. Um, so we, we've got another comment in, but yeah, I was just gonna say that um, each, uh, each college is gonna have its own resources. Um, so Arizona, Arizona State University, for example, has a program that they call their Student Accessibility and Learning Services Department. And so they have staff that are assigned specifically to that. So each institution is gonna have its own um, accessibility or disability services. They're gonna call it different things depending on where you go. Um, each state, um, so you know, if you're looking at college in a different state, you'll wanna to talk to the different departments. Um, each state will have its own vocational rehabilitation or occupational rehabilitation. Again, they're gonna call it different things. So in Arizona, it's uh, the Department of Rehabilitative Services and under them is vocational rehabilitation. Um, they will give specific training, um, whether it's hearing loss, vision loss, or combination or anything else, um, they, they will help provide those services to see what accommodations are necessary to be successful in going to college. Um, so we're thinking about things like, you know, reading assignments, um, uh, examinations you might have to take, oral exams, um, group projects, all these kinds of different things, um, and to give you training with assistive technology to make that easier, orientation skills like Dorinda was talking about. Um, so Marshall says here, um, I have Usher type 2, blind and severe hearing loss, and I want to go to college, so I'll check out that deafblind group you speak of. So I would definitely, you know, recommend that, recommend getting in touch with uh, vocational rehabilitation. They'll assign you a case counselor. Um, to work with you specifically for what your needs are and having it, both a hearing and an eye evaluation, I think would be really important um, to help figure out what, what are the goals that you have? What kind of things do you want to do in college? And then um, what are the resources you need to get there? And Voc Rehab will farm that out to different groups throughout the state. There's several nonprofits that work in all these different things. Um, so there's a lot of people who, who are ready and willing to, to work with you. And we just want to make sure we get you into the right place to do it. Definitely. A master's in assistive technology. Um, so yeah, I think that's an excellent goal. Um, it is. Definitely a lot of people to connect you with. So um, I'd have you look at Re Department of Rehabilitative Services, vocational rehabilitation. And then I think three major, um, you could correct me if you leave anybody out, but three major nonprofits in the area would be uh, Savvy Services for the Blind, that's S-A-A-V-I, um, Arizona Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and then the Foundation for Blind Children, who does a lot more than just children. Um, anybody else that you would put on that list, Dorinda? Well, um, like I said, some of my information is a little bit dated, but the... Um... I'm, I'm struggling with remembering the name, the, uh, I think it's Community Center for the, for the Deaf, but that's mm -hmm. not quite it, but I know we have it here in Tucson that, um, that is familiar with Usher and, um, and also can connect um, people with Usher to uh, services that are relevant to their visual impairment as well. One, one of the things I was just thinking of, I just wanted to um, uh, add, to all of this too, is that um, services are, are offered when they're relevant. So if you have night blindness, um, travel services are offered at night so that you have a, a real experience um, with your own limitations, for example. And we do that in the schools too. We, um, we try to provide the, provide the services um, 
for when they're most relevant and functional for the individual. Well, Marcia, thank you so much for your questions. And Dorinda, thank you for taking some time with us here on, yeah, on thank Friday you. afternoon. This is great. And for those who view us uh, in the recording, if you have any questions, feel free to, you know, uh, message us through the website, uh, give us a call, come visit us at Viewfinder, and we're happy to get you connected to these resources. Great. Thanks for the opportunity, uh, Dr. Grandilla. It was really fun. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend. Yeah.